Hi everyone. My name is Basha Ramasa and I'm the cluster executive for data analytics at IOCO. I have the great pleasure of welcoming you to episode five of the Inspire series today. Last week, we heard from Iman Rapieti on using purpose to transform. The conversation was authentic and hard hitting. And one interesting thing that stood out for me was as leaders, even with purpose, if we haven't prepared, we will not have a profit. If you did miss last week's episode, please take a moment to check out the full webinar recording on our website, ioco.tech. Stay tuned with, as Colin Isles speaks to businessman and academic Colin Coleman about purposeful leadership from a global perspective. Colin's joining us today from New York, which I think is gonna be quite an interesting perspective given the new landscape with COVID and the changes happening there. You're welcome to post all of your questions or comments in the chat for our speaker. I'd now like to hand over to Colin Isles of Innovation Catalyst We'll facilitate the conversation. Chat to you guys later. Awesome. Thank you very much, Barter, and uh, a great intro and a very warm welcome to Colin. Thank you very much for joining us, especially, and this is why we had to move the time because you're actually over in, I think, New York at the moment. So really thankful that you've made the time for this particular call. Um, to speed things up, I'm just going to quickly go through the introduction on your behalf. I hope I get most of the things right. Um, and it's an incredible CV, one of South Africa's top businessmen. 20 years at Goldman Sachs, um, leader of Goldman Sachs South Africa for I think a fair amount of that particular time. Incredibly networked, incredibly knowledgeable, um, huge amounts of experience. And that networking is also incredibly important because of the way that you have got uh, politicians that you work with very closely. You're also therefore sitting on organizations and supporting organizations like the CEO initiative to try and improve the credit rating of South Africa, youth employment service, and we might talk about some of these. Um, I think most recently, I'm not sure you've updated your LinkedIn account, but I think you've got a non-exec position now at um, the very well-known TFG, um, so uh, Forcini Group. Um, and then, of course, most recently, you took a career change and went over and lectured at Yale about investing into Africa. Colin, have I got that roughly right? I have to stop there because I know there's more I could have put in, but have I got the main parts there? Yeah, that's enough and uh, great pleasure to be with you. So we're going to go through a couple of high level themes. We've got this kind of topic that we're running with on this series about purposeful leadership. But before we can go into that, I think there's some framing questions um, that I want to pose to you and to get your views on. The first one is for IR, right? this fourth industrial revolution. And we've got a set of people out there that are promulgating this idea that this is the most significant revolution ever. It takes the agricultural revolution. It takes the manufacturing revolution. It takes the introduction of computers and those first native steps into the internet, and it just whacks them out of the park with various technologies come in, particularly in areas like, um, well, there's so many that we can mention. It could be blockchain and what's happening with Bitcoin. It could be the various types of algorithms we're seeing in artificial intelligence. It's what's happening in robotics. The list is endless. Um, and a buddy of mine, Sally Mishmel, he likes to refer to this as the moment in time uh, where it's uh, multiple Gutenberg moments that are happening at this particular point, all feeding off the back of each other. Is this accurate in your view, or is this just a sort of publication of kind of, um, you know, false expectations on steroids? Well, thanks. I, th I think it's, you know, all of these uh, questions have complicated answers, but in essence, uh, in my lifetime, what I've witnessed is the technology, re I would, I would, class as the technology revolution and that technology revolution uh, which I which I sort of woke up to I guess at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 1996 when I saw uh, Bill Gates and Larry Ellison and uh, the head of Sony on a on a panel and they were talking about where is this technology revolution going and they talked to then and only 1996 so what 25 years ago uh, uh, you know, about the fact that the uh, internet was going to take a whole bunch of forms and that would disrupt our lives. And they didn't know exactly the mechanism or the medium through which that disruption would occur, but they projected the disruption. Uh, and we now know the power of the mobile phone and what the mobile phone has done to revolutionize the way people shop, the way people travel, the way people acquire things, uh, learn things. Uh, and so the technology revolution, as we've experienced it, has been, you know, extremely uh, rapid. And we haven't yet seen 
uh, the see-through effects, I think, of the fourth industrial revolution in the form of how it's affecting the industrial world, the employment world, jobs, skills, and so on. Uh, it is there if you listen to the, um, the likes of Siemens or Amazon or how manufacturing is taking place through the world. But we haven't seen a jobless world yet, which is kind of at the heart of what the 4IR is projecting. Those who get very excited about it, they're sort of projecting a whole lot of joblessness in a machine production process or robotic production process. And it will be get increasingly robotic. But I always remember Lloyd Blankfein at Goldman Sachs saying, you know, yes, uh, I uh, said that Goldman Sachs was uh, going to become a technology bank. I, he, he sort of, I think he said he regretted making that statement. But he said, you know, the, the truth is that banking and financial services is going to become more tech-like and technology companies are going to assert themselves into the financial world, just as Walmart is going to become more Amazon-like and Amazon is going to become more Walmart-like. And so the convergence of all of this industrial processes, uh, I think, is underway. Uh, but we haven't yet seen uh, its conclusion. Just as we look back in on 1996 and we can see now that the mobile phone is what they were talking about in 1996 and all of the content and Uber and uh, the way we experience the world is just totally transformed. And I think the world of work will totally transform, but we haven't yet seen exactly how. Yeah, I think uh, there's a very good book by Kai Fu Lee, who wrote AI Superpowers, um, ex-head of Google Asia and now serial entrepreneur of multiple uh, unicorns. And he's, he's very clear in his view that you are moving into a world that's going to be huge disruption across many, many different jobs. Um, and some of the jobs are surprising. He goes and highlights things, for example, like doctors, um, even going down to surgeons, lawyers, where historically this would just be an absurd you know, statement. Equally, he goes and highlights jobs that he thinks are going to become even more important, uh, things which are, are perhaps more humane, things like nurses or even just running families, you know, and, and uh, you know, helping people. Are you in that movie where we're going to go and see this rapid uh, removal of certain jobs at a speed which is far faster than what happened on the agricultural revolution? Yeah, but before we go to how it's going to affect the jobs, I think it's going to affect how people experience. I mean, if, for example, you go to a doctor, I think what's going to happen increasingly now, hospitals, particularly in the post-COVID world, is, you know, the next generation's medical records are all going to be digitized. So doctors, hospitals, uh, and so on, it's, it's going to become a very different experience you know, the, the old world of going to your GP and the GP opens this massive file with your lifetime of health checks, you know, that's going to go. He's going to have it all on his phone. Uh, and for that matter, you might have your operations online, you know. So I, I think the way people experience the world, we're kind of midway somewhere uh, in the digitization process of the life experience. And I think it's going to go a lot further. When it gets there, then how work is deployed and who's in jobs and obviously the skills that are necessary is going to dramatically transform. And obviously, net net for a place like Africa, it means that higher skilling is going to be the name of the game. Uh, and the lower skilled jobs are going to be under threat, which raises huge amounts of issues about unemployment and how people are going to source income. Yeah, absolutely. Now, we've got uh, two arguments on that. One is it could be net positive because like with mobile technology, we jumped over a layer. We didn't have to go and um, put some expensive infrastructure that had been uh, done in the, um, in the first world. The other argument is we're so unprepared for it um, that this is going to be incredibly damaging because we're going to lose our ability to compete in all sorts of industries on a global basis. Um, do you have a view on that? I suppose the theme there is that this automation is going to make it incredibly cheap to do products and services overseas. And if we don't have that, that data set and that skill set um, to go and actually offer something comparable, it's just going to walk away from our markets. Yeah, look, there are going to be whole industries that are much more active. Uh, for example, data centers, you know, uh, and you're already seeing in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, 
the creation of data center um, operations um, and actually, you know, private equity firms very, very active in funding and operating those because they attract very high multiples on exit and so on and so forth. So you're going to see a bunch of capital investment and a bunch of financial mobilization into the space uh, that is going to be, you know, quite um, noticeable and, and dramatic. I, I think the answer is that you're going to have both uh, disruption and you're going to have new creation and it's going to be a hybrid. So, but it's interesting to watch the Biden uh, election campaign and the new administration because their whole um, promotion of effectively ESG investing uh, and energy and climate change providing a new window on capital investment on a very large scale and effectively uh, repurposing uh, the infrastructure in the United States um, is a good example of the fact that that provides jobs, it provides capital investment opportunities, uh, it provides huge wealth creation opportunities, and it means eliminating old infrastructure in South Africa, you know, the just, just transition away from the coal industry, for example, is going to have to be faced. And I know Andre de Reiter, the CEO of ESCOM, you know, is very actively engaged in thinking about how that will take place and how renewables will go into the mix uh, and the extent to which uh, effective clean energy sources are going to replace dirty energy sources. And then you go to a place like Nigeria where you have effectively diesel as the dominant energy source. It's the most expensive for the country and for the small businesses. Uh, and it's the most polluting, but effectively there's a cartel operating of those who are benefiting from uh, the, you know, the uh, production and the distribution of diesel and the consumption of diesel that is very, very powerful in the country. There's no other explanation as to why they don't have new large sources of energy to displace this expensive and polluting energy sources. And I think in Africa, for example, just as you mentioned, the mobile phone disrupted fixed line and completely replaced it. You'll get the same in energy with battery fired power, for example, dis disrupting and di replacing eventually the diesel uh, vested interests in those economies. This must put Andre and Eskom in a very difficult position. Are you, because on the one hand, you've got a market which is moving onto photovoltaic already or wind in certain aspects, and that's just accelerating. We've got a very clear expectation that not only is solar already cheaper than most, if not all, fossil fuels, it's just getting cheaper still because of tech change and because of quantum dynamics, more production, more demand, more production, more demand. So the cost um, is going down. And you've got the reverse for the providers because they're seeing the costs go up as there's less supply in terms of that particular sector. So it's a very difficult position. Are you disappointed about the race of progress ESCOM has been making to push for the green energies? And, and what's their escape route? Well, I, th I think it's not so much ESCOM. The, the, new, the new energy route has actually got to be introduced and facilitated by government because they are the people licensing the rounds. Uh, but actually, if you have a look at what has happened, even though it's in the overall of, let's say, 50,000 megawatts of total supply of energy into South Africa, it's still maybe, you know, 10% is clean sources of energy at this point in time. So there's a lot of, uh, of uh, blue sky. But having said that, it's been very successful how much private industry has come into the renewable energy space. Uh, and you've attracted foreign direct investment, the likes of Enel and a variety of foreign companies into it. Uh, and I think South Africa's climate, you know, just its natural gift of climate is, it makes it a very natural place for clean sources of energy to come in. So I think there's a, there's alignment of interest and obviously government must accelerate the licensing rounds and make that happen. They're saying they're going to do it. They seem to be quite slow about it. They tend to put more obstacles or more barriers to entry in the form of uh, empowerment and other conditionalities to their tenders uh, than may be uh, advisable. But, uh, you know, they are on this path and they need to accelerate that path.
I think Africa as a whole needs to accelerate that path. And I think, you know, the battery fired power companies, the likes of Tesla and the French and European companies that are competitors to them, uh, you know, haven't yet really woken up to the opportunity in Africa being so large. And I think we'll get there. So are we going to have to see the, um, the government um, structurally make a change in their operating model? Because we've got 4IR, which is driving this huge global change in multiple industries. And then we've got this huge issue with global warming, which Bill Gates has made so transparent and clear and, and written about so frequently. I follow him and I think he, he uh, really hits the nail on the head. We have got to find a way to reduce and remove carbon from the atmosphere. So you've got these kind of two levers which are having significant impacts at every single level. And I wonder if there needs to be a change in the way that the ANC are absolutely directing their attention and, and funding and support for different industries to go and solve these two interesting problems. Look, the world, the world is very complex. And when you reduce that complexity from a global scale into the South African environment, as one example, that those complexities play themselves out, don't they, in so many multiple ways. So you've got the climate change issue, you've got the employment crisis in South Africa, you've got the hunger crisis in South Africa, the COVID crisis doesn't, is laid over that. You've got a political crisis, in a sense, uh, within the ruling party and a moral crisis in society that's all linked into the legacy of the apartheid uh, legacy producing a situation where uh, the, the outsiders of the system are battling to effectively use the modern constitutional tools to compete for resources. And therefore you see the rise of the Zuma corruption phenomenon, which is, it's not just a, a series of events, it's a societal movement, uh, which uh, effectively is authorizing a political party regime to use its political capital to capture and distribute economic resources to those who can't compete for it in a modern constitutional way, which feeds this uh, ruling party um, uh, division uh, and competition for the soul of uh, the ANC. I mean, it's quite certain that if Mandela was alive today, um, he would be looking greatly askance, the Tambo um, uh, legacy and so on. So if they'd be looking at the ANC today disbelievingly as, as to where we have got to, for example, with a secretary general up on corruption charges and manipulating you know, the integrity committee's uh, um, compulsion for uh, the ruling party to effectively move in, remove anybody with corruption charges. But these are the complexities of a global world that effectively uh, now uh, compresses into a South African environment. And you've got so many different outcomes that can, that can eventuate. But is it important for South Africa to, to effectively deconstruct its reality? When I say deconstruct, I have a, an architecture background. And the, the notion of deconstruction in architecture was that you take a physical image and a physical set of objects and you pull them apart to their component elements and then you rearrange them and uh, completely uh, without reference to the original object, although the original object is inherent in the elements, you construct a new product that is a result of the deconstructivism. In a sense, that's what your question is. We need to deconstruct our reality and reconstruct it in a way that is most constructive for what we need to achieve. What do we need in South Africa? We need a democratic constitutional state that protects the integrity of what people fought for over the last 50 years. We need uh, the future of each South African to be full of opportunity, not to be um, effectively uh, a captive, not for individuals to be a captive of their past, of their lack of skills or their lack of access to schools or their lack of access to food, uh, which is the reality for half the population in South Africa. We need mm. um, the economy to allow for 
those inside and outside to be in there with that is why the youth employment service was effectively constructed to allow unemployed youth to have access to youth internship opportunities paid for by businesses in businesses, businesses to get the benefit of that. We have about a 30% absorption rate. We just came out of a youth employment service board meeting this morning of the 50,000 people that have gone through the internship program so far, 30% have been absorbed into employ uh, permanent positions of one form or another, which is, I think, a remarkable achievement. You know, we would love to see many more people, uh, you know, get the opportunities. But this is how to deconstruct and reconstruct reality is through a very thoughtful process of taking all of these complex forces in the world and making the best of it in our reality. Are you hopeful we're going to make progress? Obviously, you're on things like the CEO initiative and have been on various initiatives for the last you know, 20 or 30 years to try to make a positive impact. Are you, are you, have you seen positive impacts? Are you still hopeful we're going to see them going forward? Well, let me just say, Colin, I'm writing a book uh, at the moment. It's top secret. Please don't mention it publicly. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's in a novel-like form about South Africa through the 40 years of my life since I was 18 years old when my, um, uh, when my brother, just older than me, was detained by the security police. And um, when you look at the last 40 years in South Africa and you, you think about the struggle for liberation, you think about the rise of Mandela and that crowning moment, you know, at the... World Cup when South Africa uh, won the rugby and Mandela embraced the country and through it there was this unleashing of the great uh, sort of sense of liberation of our souls, not just the victory at the World Cup. Uh, through to the Mbeki masterful management of the economy, although he had his blind spots and those blind spots giving rise to Zuma and the Zuma era of 10, 10 years of attack on this democratic institutional system and taking South Africa back. And what we're doing now is trying to restore some of that Mandela magic back into the system through the rise and supporting the rise of Ramaphosa. The truth is he's been there three years and he's achieved far less than we would have hoped. But we're much better off with him having achieved far less than we would have been uh, mm -hmm. had um, the Zuma era effectively gone on uh, through his chosen successor. Uh, and we see that phenomenon in the Zondo Commission. So again, it's not an uncomplicated answer because the truth is we're winning some victories as a nation uh, in, the, in the battle against corruption and in saving our democracy but we're losing important battles. Uh, so we haven't been defeated, but we're not significantly enough. Now, I'm not talking about one individual in the form of the president. I'm talking as a country. We're not significantly enough advancing the cause of democracy. We're not significantly enough demonstrating the benefits of a, a modern economy to the citizens who have been locked out. We're not uh, yet... Uh, succeeding in clamping down on corruption through prosecutions. We're not seeing enough of those victories. There are some. Uh, so when you ask me, are we doing enough in the CO initiative, in the youth employment service and so on, I would say there is a valiant battle being fought and we are making some uh, victories happen, but we're nowhere near where we should be as a country. And we have to support the forces of good um, in South Africa. And it's only ourselves to blame if we don't. You know, it's, this is our opportunity. And I always look back on the Mbeki era. And I remember, you know, he was really an out, for, from a business perspective. He was an outstanding president in terms of taking what was a very broken economy and rebuilding it. And we, we saw by 2006, 2000 seven pre-global financial crisis, the benefits hitting four or 5% growth per annum. Um, and yet business people were not uh, vocally supporting President Mbeki. There was no sense of 
people getting out there and really beating the drum. This was uh, the the leadership that we wanted. Uh, and it's the same thing now with President Ramaphosa. People must, uh, you know, of course, comment good and bad on achievements, but I think they must get out there and to play their part in a very, very active way. Because, you know, life is not about commentary. The life is about what you're doing to change, to change the realities. Let's, let's just pivot um, on the back of that to, uh, to the corporate environment and then maybe go uh, more into the financial services as well. So with these changes that are going through, and, and I know your answer is going to be complex. Uh, I've got that now. Um, we're seeing a huge movement um, being driven by actually quite well-known you know, leaders. Take um, uh, BlackRock, for example, where they're pushing this conscious capitalism you know, ideal where they're saying at the end of the day, you're not going to have stewardship and sustainability of your organization unless you have organizations which are a lot more focused towards um, sustainable issues, you know, sustainable development goals, carbon reduction, um, which sort of flies in the face of our history where companies could have all sorts of negative externalities and there was no penalization, you know, for it. And he's kind of suggesting that there's a new type of leadership and a new type of organization that's needed. Do you think that this is true? And are we starting to see this new type of organization develop? Uh, it's definitely true. I mean, it's definitely true that, you know, in the United States, just as much as in South Africa or uh, in Europe, uh, you know, raw capitalism that is unmitigated, uh, driven solely for shareholder benefit, uh, is unsustainable. Let's just put it in that sort of way that we've seen in countries like South Africa that it is the business of business to create the conditions of business. And when conditions of business are an environmental question, so what environment do we create for uh, societies, for our communities, for economic growth, for political, the political environment? And we have to have a total view. Now, I think uh, that uh, there are limits as to from, a, for example, a US perspective, how are those, um, those changes, I was gonna say tinkering with capitalism is operating. And I, I think the German model, the German co-determination model is very interesting for South Africa because what that co-determination model does is it takes all employees, uh, including through their trade unions uh, represent, representatives, into the decision making about the operations of those enterprises through the co-determination model. So you have unions represented on the boards, uh, you have employees with stakes, employee share ownership positions, uh, and it feels far more fundamental, fundamentally driven. Whereas our empowerment strategies in South Africa have been rather shallow uh, and limited and experimental. And I think the the reality is coming home that unless we give people a stake in the businesses themselves, there will continue to be a them and us. It's like the public sector unions in South Africa, you know, basically saying we're going to ask for 3% over inflation uh, wage increases when we know the, the balance sheet of the state can't afford it. And yet we don't want to be measured in terms of the production that we uh, or is, is associated with that income. So, you know, we just want the state to pay. We don't want the state to behave as an employer. Uh, so, you know, these things cannot survive. You know, you can't survive as, ca as capitalists in, in, in the world by just crowding out and ignoring your stakeholders. And you cannot survive as a union uh, in a place like South Africa's government by trying to ignore the imper the financial and fiscal imperatives that are real constraints. So, you know, that, that era when you had Sir Ramaphosa as Secretary General of the National Union of Mine Workers and Bobby Godsell as the head of Human Resources of Anglo-American coming to terms with how they were going to deal with uh, the strike in, in Anglo in the late 80s. You know, that era of co-determination and really from a realization that they both needed each other uh, 
coming to terms in a creative way. You know, those sorts of leadership examples, I think, is what we need to look, look to for inspiration now. Do you think we're going to see a natural move where you see CEOs looking for purpose more? Again, that's another shareholder letter that Fink um, has sent out and started to promulgate where he said. And, the, and I guess the idea behind this is create a purpose, create something which is not altruistic, but you're just genuinely trying to offer value to your customers or society at large. And your, your profits will actually come as a byproduct of it, where a lot of organizations are kind of profit led and they say, we're going to make this margin and pay this dividend over the next couple of years. And they try to go and build around that. Do you think that, kind, well, firstly, do you think that's actually an accurate statement that purposeful organizations can um, outperform? And if and whatever your answer is, are we going to see a movement towards that to some degree naturally, or are we going to need some structural change? I mean, I think that's, that in a way is the beauty of capitalism is that the, the capitalist system does provide for the mobilization of resources, both financial and, and people resources into market vacuums. I mean, I always, you know, I don't, I don't know if people have seen Jack Dorsey talk about uh, how his business was created or, or the Uber creation, you know, uh, being on the Paris streets, not being able to get a cab, getting frustrated, saying, why can't I just have something on my phone where I call a, uh, a vehicle and that creating Uber because it was fulfilling an immediate need. Now, if you think of all the needs in the world, you know, that are social needs, that are energy needs, that are um, uh, financial needs, the rise of M-Pesa, the rise of uh, all of these technology solutions, you know, they're all fulfilling a market need. So in that sense, you know, the think purpose thought piece is powerful and fits in with how do we mobilize resources to uh, solve societal problems that are not being solved. And, the, you know, of course, you have I, to I have profit. I start interrupt on that point, because I think all of those examples are basically, you know, were startups with incredibly um, passionate founders and, you know, the normal stories about working with uh, garages and uh, borrowing money from your close friends and family. And then uh, five to ten years later, you become an overnight success. So we've got loads of examples of these kind of per yeah, Tesla is another example, not quite in the garage. But, you know, we're going to go make sustainable transport, you know, commonplace. And you build up from there. And, and now everyone knows about Tesla. My, my question really was more about the existing incumbents. Because if you're a startup and you're naive and you just go and solve this problem, which I think you need to be, you know, you can do incredible things. And on a portfolio basis, there's gazillions of companies out there who try and fail, but a couple, you know, actually make it. So we see the results. Incumbents find it, I think, difficult um, to follow that type of model. I don't, is that unfair? No, I think, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, the you know, digital phone versus the Polaroids or the you know, the Konicas, you know, the, those that absolutely got wiped out because they didn't respond to technology advances versus those that rose, you know, to basically eat the lunch of, of the incumbents that were too slow to change. Uh, but there are the examples of, I mean, I always found it very fascinating listening to the likes of the Siemens CEO talk about how they repurposed the whole industrial processing um, and the, you know, the use of robotics and the use of digital information to change the manufacturing and to bring the cost down and make the, uh, the effectiveness and the efficiency and the product quality improve uh, through their re-engineering of their, of their processes. I mean, it's, so clearly leadership is about re-engineering and being responsive and um, deciding what skills you need and how to repurpose these things and what's obsolete, you know, and recognizing when there is something obsolete. I mean, obviously, you know, the discussion about South African airways, is it obsolete or not obsolete to have a national airline in a country? Uh, you know, will the tourism industry be served by the rise of a new uh, privately run airline sufficiently to get numbers? It's easy to say, oh no, just close down SAA and let these private airlines rise. But are they going to rise fast enough to service incoming traffic in the post-COVID world? 
you know, that, and, and you could apply that to many different sectors, many different situations. The beauty of it is there is a, uh, a marketplace where if the incumbents don't react fast enough, they will get replaced and they will become obsolete by the new entrants. Um, and then there are, when I say new entrants, I mean, I was at Davos in 1997 and I sat next to this person and I said to him, Hi, who are you? He said, oh, I'm Larry. I said, well, uh, what are you here for? He said, no, no, I've come to receive my Global Leader for Tomorrow reward. Uh, I said, what for? He said, no, no, I've created a new company. It's, uh, it's called Google. So I said, well, um, what does Google do? This was 1997. So he said, no, it's an information search engine. I said, I'm sorry, Larry, I don't understand. What does that mean? He said, no, imagine if you took all the encyclopedias in the world and you put them online. I said, well, that sounds amazing. Uh, so how many people use your encyclopedias? So he said, no, no, uh, I've got my, my startup is in my garage in California. Uh, but at the moment, about a million people use it. Mm. And then I woke up, wow, this is something special. Great. But, you know, you know, that Larry Page story of just creating in his garage with Sergey this information search engine to provide as much information online as possible, that, that vision, you know, that just the impulse of human beings to create is so powerful. And who would have said in 1997, this would be a trillion dollar company or whatever it is now, uh, over a billion users or uh, however many, many there are. From how do you, how do you think about mindset in the incumbents though? Because I always feel a bit sorry for CEOs that are, you know, thinking in the way of a Larry Page or uh, whoever you want to take as your top founder innovator. They've, they've got shareholders that demand you know, dividends every year, year in, year out. They've got big investment communities coming through asset managers and analysts and pension funds demanding you operate in a certain way. You've got a board which is, you know, focused on control and, you know, making sure that, uh, and yet all these things seem to constrain them. So if they wanted to step out and to start to try to do something where, you know, if you take Amazon, where you're investing potentially a significant amount of your revenue back into innovation programs, which may or may not succeed, they're, they're almost handcuffed to go and do this. It feels to me like there's a structural issue for them. I think that's that's in the nature of a maturing organization. Uh, but they they seem to have maintained their innovation. And partly the role of Wall Street has also been to help them think about how do they manage their shareholder relationships, but at the same time create uh, organizations that are investment holding companies that allow capital to go into continued innovation whilst the mothership, you know, the mainstream business, which is Google continues, they can then create their Google cars or uh, what other, whatever other forms of innovation carry on. Um, you know, and ultimately, I guess there will be those companies that really unbundle and it'll be, uh, you know, a process of uh, reinvigoration of those those companies, and if they don't respond enough, they'll they'll end up being, you know, the dinosaurs that they were started to uh, take on in the first place. You know, so it, it is a, I think, an ongoing uh, process of evolution. So you you've just taken up a role on on the Fashini Group. Is this? Um... You know, I don't know uh, what your um, sort of mandate and focus points is going to be, but is this something that you'd like to promulgate through to try to go and encourage that type of disruption within that entity? Or is that going beyond the role of what a board can actually do? So, you know, it's interesting. I, I joined the Fashini group um, a year ago. Uh, so I've been, I've been now on the board through that time. Uh, and it's my first public company board in the post Goldman Sachs environment. I am on other boards, but they're not public com publicly listed companies. And it's been fascinating, you know, a bunch of wise uh, old executives on this board. And it's interesting to see how they operate. And, and I think it's a very high quality operation. They're a very dynamic CEO in the form of Anthony Turnstrom. And Anthony is constantly looking at innovative ways of uh, reinventing the business and, and, you know, Michael Lewis, the chairman, uh, supports that entirely. And I think the board, you know, 
is is actively looking at ways in which the whole online uh, business can can be accelerated, and they have the best, the leading position. I think it's about thirty percent of all internet fashion sales uh, is through the Fashini Group, and it's the biggest by a wide margin. But they're not they're not resting on their laurels. They, they're like very actively thinking about how do they deepen that and accelerate it. And so it's um, it's very interesting to see the way a public company board works with its governance and at the same time drive innovation as a company. Yeah. What role have banks got to play in these transformations that are going through? I mean, they are the oil that uh, business requires on to actually do business. Look, I think, back, you know, obviously banks are looking for a return on their money and they're investing money. They want to make sure that that's done in a risk-weighted way that on a probability risk-weighted basis, they're getting their return on capital themselves. So that's ultimately their purpose. Uh, but they you know, they have a vital uh, uh, role to play in oiling the wheels of enterprise uh, and of society as a whole. Um, and so what we saw what happened in, you know, 2008 with the global financial crisis, when effectively that economic system of the banks seized up, they, there was no liquidity, people didn't get money, money doesn't go into the economies, the economy stopped functioning. It's like a heart attack. It causes a heart attack to the system. Uh, so they have a vital facilitational role in, econ in economies. In particular uh, um, companies, you know, there's obviously a provision of liquidity in the form of debt finance, equity finance, and so on and so forth. Uh, but there's also, you know, I think a very active active role that banks play in terms of idea generation of what can companies be doing within the industry to compete in the industries what can companies be doing to reorganize to be more effective how do they attract uh, shareholder interest how do they unlock value through taking businesses that are low multiple value creators and separating them from high multiple value creators and you know trying to get a greater than the sum of the parts um, valuation for the whole enterprise. Uh, you know, so there's many layers, there's many layers at which banks are operating. Uh, no question, they, they need to be regulated uh, very yeah. actively because the societal impacts of banks, as we saw the global financial crisis in the negative, uh, and at the same time, in many, in many instances, in the positive, uh, they have a dramatic impact on the functioning of society. Do you think they need to be, um, actually a, a different way to ask that one, if we've got all of the other industries and, and CEOs having to really take a, a detailed look at this conscious capitalism and the sustainable development goals, you've got startups popping up everywhere who are using that to go and design you know, brilliant new products and services. Are banks going to have to make a similar move? And I'm going to ask a really naive question to sort of put context. Can we imagine a time where banks actually stop lending to some of the dirty industries? Well, I think there's, a, there's, there's certainly a start of that, of that process, um, you know, where, um, I mean, in Goldman Sachs, you know, there, there was um, uh, a very clear set of guidelines as to what, what one could fund within certain parameters. No. So there are layers of that. There's really things that you're not allowed to fund, including those things that government says are sanctioned countries or industries or things like that. Then there's a bunch of things that are internally layered by the, by the bank on itself that they don't want to be investing, for example, uh, in the coal industry. I mean, you know, there, were a la there was a layer of things that either couldn't be done or processes through which you had to go before you could fund or invest or advise on uh, any one of those industries. So that, that process is, that horse has bolted long time ago. Um, now, you know, uh, one wouldn't have been able to fund the marijuana industry, you know, 20 years ago. Now that industry has opened up uh, because of, societal change 
uh, will it be that you won't be able to 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 uh, to uh, finance uh, the casino industry or the tobacco industry or this industry or that industry? It's quite possible, um, but that's an evolving social contract between the banks and the society. Do you think we're going to see, this was a conversation I was having with um, with Charles Savage. It goes back to what we said earlier, where he said that the kind of Friedman shareholder only uh, model has uh, really gone and we, we've got to move on from that. You can't, you've got to focus on your, your whole ecosystem, your staff, your customer society at large. It's just not tolerable anymore and the system doesn't work. But there's a counter argument uh, looking forward coming through, which says, we're seeing more and more retail investors access companies directly through platforms like Robinhood. We're seeing more and more of them getting onto social groups where they're sharing their conversations. And there's this um, possibility that as customers, maybe we're going into the Nike store or we're going into the Amazon Go shop, you know, in the UK, and we're associating so directly with those organizations because we think they're doing so well, that that will become the driver for the share price above and beyond what we're seeing from institutional investors. And that will put pressure on the CEOs to actually care more about their customers and society at large. Again, it's not just a crazy, naive, you know, thought process about where we might be going. Now, look, I think, I think this technology has, you know, made the world smaller. It's made everything we do more visible. Uh, it has created uh, speed. Uh, and it has also democratized the tools. So the Robin Hood phenomenon, you know, is certainly one where, whereas 20 years ago, there would have been no way in which retail traders could have had this impact uh, mm. on the market at, at, at this velocity, uh, that they are able to, you know, sitting on their laptops at home, uh, aggregate through marketplaces and communication a view on a stock and drive it like they have, uh, it seems, done. So uh, the, the democratization of tools is this kind of its own subset of what is going on. And the fact is the market has become now more accessible and those tools are in the hands of people who've got a laptop. You don't have to yeah. be sitting in a trading room at Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan or Deutsche Bank uh, in order to trade shares. Uh, and, and so that, that whole environment, uh, you know, and, and the banks are, I think, a lot about, you know, what does that mean in terms of how they can bring lower the costs and how they can drive uh, debt and equity trading and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I, I do think that will uh, transform the way in which, uh, you know, financial relations are conducted in the world. I, I'm sure you saw earlier in the year, Jamie Dimon, uh, I don't think it was meant to go public, but he was quoted as saying that he is um, extremely scared about the fintech um, impact. So I, he didn't use the word extremely, I won't use the word that he did use. He was quite, uh, quite forceful in his opinion there. And then I was chatting to a, uh, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Chris Skinner, who's been on these interviews uh, last year. He's a um, really interesting uh, thought leader in terms of where we're seeing fintech and banking go. He put a prediction out yesterday that up to 20% of the major banks might end up being purchased by fintech startups of today in about a decade. Mm. What, what's your view on, the, on, <laughs> on either or of those you know, statements from these guys? I think it was about uh, beginning of 2018, I went to uh, see the Apple headquarters and meet with the Apple leadership uh, about Africa at the time. And uh, while I was in Palo Alto, California, near Cupertino, where the Apple headquarters is, I went to see a couple of companies. One of them was Stripe. Stripe is uh, mm. uh, effectively a company that a fintech company set up to provide uh, payment systems for businesses. And I went to see them and was having a discussion. Now they worth tens of billions of dollars now. Um, and I was amazed because the relationship between what they're doing in regulation was almost an afterthought. Um, meaning they were now providing 
global systems to any party uh, for payments systems so that businesses don't have to have them effectively outsource these payment systems to Stripe. And I was asking them, so how do you work in an exchange control environment like we have in South Africa, where you know, companies are constrained by exchange controls? So the world of regular, and they, they were sort of somewhat taken aback by the question, the world of regulation, and this is going to obviously with cryptocurrencies and so on and so forth, become increasingly worrisome for governments, for central banks, for regulators. How do you control these uh, digitized payment systems in the world in such a manner that you're protecting end to end and you managing the regulatory environment? They're gonna to have to really apply their minds as to how that, how that practically functions. So it's not just a problem for the banks themselves. It's also a problem for the regulators, for the banks, they have to become more, far more embedded with fintech themselves. So Goldman Sachs, for example, I'm not speaking on their behalf. I'm now no longer at Goldman Sachs. But if, if you have a look at their, their consumer plan, um, you know what effectively they're doing is using digital uh, tools um, to... They had a very, had a very cool uh, tie-up with Marcus, didn't they? That was one of the initiatives Correct. that... Awesome. They've got digital tools to access the consumer market in, at the moment, the United States and the UK, um, and doing extremely well. You know, then you've got the JP Morgan, uh, you know, model where the, which has been built with the infrastructure that goes along with branches over many years. That's extraordinarily powerful. Uh, and over time, time will tell, you know, what, what would you rather be? Would you rather be a Goldman Sachs with a fintech arm that you're going to grow? Or would you rather be JP Morgan with the power of uh, the physical branches, the relationships, the people networks that go along? I mean, the market says, you know, uh, the market cap of JP Morgan, something like $300 billion. The market cap of Goldman Sachs, about $115 billion. You know, so there's, there's lots of upside potential. And then you've got these fintech companies like Stripe that are going to be very, very large. Uh, they're not just small startups. They were, but now they're very substantial uh, and powerful market players. I'll go back to uh, where we started here. And um, well dodged on the, um, the answer to that question, by the way, about whether we'll see 20% in the next 10 years. But... When you were um, when you were at Yale and obviously talking to not just you know your colleagues or students your other um, network that's out there, what's their view on investing in Africa at the moment? What's the sort of challenges you've faced in trying to encourage them to be Africa positive? Um, so, I mean, the the big picture I guess is that you know Africa is either going to be a massive threat or a massive opportunity. It's not something you can ignore. Uh, I'll say that again. It's either going to be a massive opportunity or a massive threat. It's not something anyone can ignore. Yeah. So it, it doesn't matter if you're sitting in the United States and you think Africa is a basket case, or you're sitting in the United States and you think, wow, there's like this massive consumer demographic McKinsey reported boom going on in Africa that we want to grasp. And you know, whichever way you are, you have to pay attention. And the reality is in at the turn of this coming century, 21st century, as we go into, um, into 2100, a two in five people in the world will be African, 40% yes, of the world's population. And yet today with 17% of the world's population, we only have 3% of the world's GDP. So if that continues, if that rate of contribution of resources to, G, to population continues, there's only one conclusion, and that's Africa is going to be a massive liability to the world. So Africa's growth rate has to significantly go up. And I've calculated somewhere in the region of 6% in order for that 3 to 17% delta to change over time, because you can be sure the 17% is going to go to 38, 39, 40% of the world's population. How much is the 3% going to go to, let's say, half of that population contribution? 
So if you're going to get 6% GDP growth rates as the population explosion occurs in Africa, that will be the world's largest absolute growth contribution. Like China was in the last 40 years, Africa will be in the next 40. So if that's true, then if you're sitting in New York and you look in Africa, you're thinking, how do I take advantage of this massive growth that's going to happen? If I'm a Walmart or I'm a Exxon or I'm a JP Morgan or whoever I am, how do I take advantage of that enormous growth rate? And if you're a government and you, you know, you Angela Merkel uh, in Germany and you're thinking, if I don't get this to happen, and there's this massive humanitarian disaster coming in Africa on my doorstep, all I'm gonna get is this wave of migration from Africa into Europe. And it's gonna be a humanitarian catastrophe causing huge political repercussions in my home market in Germany. And you have the rise of anti-migration uh, movements, uh, right-wing movements in Europe as a result and you get this explosion of political populism that will be very difficult to deal with. So the bottom line of what I was saying in the research that I was publishing, the talks I was giving in my lectures is, it's in the common interest of the world to combine efforts, to cooperate, whether you're Chinese or the United States or Europe, to get Africa to grow and to participate in that growth. Uh, and if you don't do that, then there's going to be a very common uh, negative outcome that people will experience. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Colin. And we've got about a few minutes left, so I think we'll have to close off, which is a shame because I had another set of questions. Anyway, Varsha, let me hand over to you. Thanks, Colin. And, and sorry, on that note, I do have one question. It sounded a bit dire, I think, those last statements. I'm almost picturing this dystopian future. So on a different note, um, do you see education changing? Because if I look at even Sonny's comments um, that he sent through here, it all starts with skills. You see things like the growth of Khan Academy, et cetera. So do we, do we see the face of that changing? And is there hope in that? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I uh, taught uh, the Yale first semester uh, in person, January, February last year. And then I was back in South Africa when the COVID crisis hit and I stayed and I taught March, April online and you know the the experience of teaching online was very effective I, i'm not saying it is everything that uh it could be in person but it's amazing what you can do now if you take the you know technology platforms mm -hmm. and you apply it to getting high quality education into poor communities there's no reason why those classes can't be available to thousands and thousands of people. Um, it's just an elite university. Uh, it happens to be an Ivy League university, but I'm, I'd be happy to have a, a classroom, maybe ICO can arrange it, where we get 100,000 students in South Africa to come and listen to a talk on uh, doing business in Africa, uh, the last frontier of global growth. Oh, that sounds exciting. Colin, with that, I do need to close off. Um, I just want to express my deep gratitude to both of you today for your time and incredible insights and Colin Isles for facilitating today's session. And thank you for everyone else who has participated. A shout out and special mention to some of our guests who joined today. We've got ID3, Nedbank, Brawl, Nampak, Sassel, just to name a few. We understand time is valuable, especially now. So knowing that you're here and supporting these types of initiatives really does mean a lot. Next week, we speak to Andrew Wood, who's the CEO of The Unlimited, about using purpose to develop autonomous, high-performance teams. So please make sure you sign up for that one. The success of, of things like these series is not possible without the contributions and participation of people who are on this call. So with that, goodbye, everyone. Stay safe and chat to you again soon. Bye.